This episode of GT the Podcast is supported by Alcon. This is Ike Ahmed. And I'm Arsham Shabani. And we want to welcome you to GT the Podcast. We're bringing this to you together with BMC and Glaucoma Today. To offer audible insights into current topics in glaucoma care. Presented by the authors of our latest, most read GT articles. Check it out. Welcome to GT the Podcast. In this episode, Drs. Finney John and Natasha Kolomeyer recap the article, Lessons in Dissatisfaction. And later, Dr. Alex Papp recaps her article, Not Your Grandma's Puff Test, both from the November-December issue of Glaucoma Today. The number one lesson I have learned from a surgical patient occurred during my fellowship year when I saw a middle-aged woman with severe glaucoma that resulted in small central islands of vision bilaterally. Her initial consultation revealed that each eye had a visual acuity of 2040 and IOP ranging from 32 to 34 millimeters of mercury on multiple medications. The patient had enlarged cup to disc ratios in both eyes and ancillary testing made it clear that filtration surgery would be necessary to prevent disease progression. Within a few weeks, she underwent successful trabeculectomy with the placement of an express glaucoma filtration device made by Alcon and adjunctive mitomycin C in both eyes. Despite well-controlled postoperative IOPs, the patient was frustrated that her vision had not improved. It was then that I realized that our goals of intervention and definitions of success had been misaligned. I loaded her visual field test results onto the monitor that she could see from her exam chair and tried to find the best words to explain her condition after we had already intervened. At this point, I knew that a direct delivery of facts with empathy was the best path forward. I patiently reviewed her exam findings and test results with her and paused intermittently to assess if she was grasping the critical nature of her disease. I could sense the mood in the room shift as she recognized that total blindness had been a very real possibility without immediate surgery. She began to cry. Over the next couple of weeks, she was very understanding when we explained that we needed to lyse sutures to optimize her pressures. She also became more verbally engaged and started to participate actively in her own care our communication improved tremendously. Ultimately, this experience taught me the importance of a patient yet persistent approach to evaluating and communicating with patients who may not understand the severe nature of their disease. It also taught me that no matter how busy clinic may be, some encounters will simply require more time than others, especially to set proper expectations before any kind of intervention. Navigating this road while maintaining a sense of calm is the challenge, but also the joy of clinical care. My patients have taught me a lot. Although most cases go well, complications do occur. And as my mentor often says, the only way to avoid complications is to avoid surgery altogether. Every glaucoma surgeon has dealt with suprachoroidal hemorrhages, choroidal effusions, bleb leaks, and clinical hypotony if they've performed enough cases. Patient dissatisfaction can accompany complications, but it doesn't always. The following are a few key insights into patient satisfaction and dissatisfaction that I have gained over time. Number one, satisfaction is relative. One of my patients underwent three procedures in one month. He experienced an IOP spike after cataract surgery that did not resolve with tube shunt implantation and eventually required cyclophotocoagulation. Although I had expected this patient to be dissatisfied and disappointed, I was surprised by his contentment. On the other hand, the mildest transient microhyphema with 20-20 visual acuity that resolved in less than two weeks caused another patient immense stress and dissatisfaction. Patient satisfaction is certainly relative. Number two, transparency and understanding go a long way. I have learned to inform patients if something out of the ordinary happens and to be clear about why they may need to see me more frequently. 
the burden of frequent visits is real, regardless of the patient's visual outcome. I remember an 88-year-old patient who had persistent shallow anterior chambers and choroidal effusions after tube shunt surgery. She brought in a different grandchild every time she saw me during her post-operative period. After we got past the initial discomfort, we eventually joked that I was glad she had at least 12 grandchildren to make use of. I was grateful for the opportunity to meet her whole family, although I would have never wished that experience upon her. Number three, dissatisfaction is often temporary. One of my patients made it very clear that she was upset that I had shown a photo of my new baby to another patient, but not to her. Overcoming her dissatisfaction was as uncomfortable as dealing with some of the challenging surgical and clinical situations mentioned earlier. I have learned, however, that it is sometimes necessary to deal with that temporary discomfort in order to develop stronger relationships with patients. Typically, dissatisfaction stems from a misunderstanding or misalignment of expectations. In most cases, glaucoma is a lifelong disease and we have the pleasure and the challenge of accompanying patients through all of the trials and triumphs that occur along the way. Many patients likely recall the days of the dreaded puff test, the form of pneumatic tonometry that had them stressing over their eye appointments. Today, another form of puff test has become relevant, the measurement of corneal hysteresis. Recently, the importance of corneal hysteresis in determining the risk of glaucoma and its progression has been a hot topic of discussion. As with all diagnostic information, corneal hysteresis has prompted ophthalmologists to question how this new puff test can facilitate clinical decision-making and, more importantly, whether the modality should be adopted in routine practice. This article provides a closer look at the use and utility of corneal hysteresis. Corneal hysteresis is a biomechanical parameter produced by the ocular response analyzer and measured by a puff of air. Corneal hysteresis is often described as a measurement of tissue elasticity, but may be more accurately thought of as a measurement of tissue compliance. Using a puff of air, the ore records two pressures, the pressure at which the cornea bends in and the pressure at which it returns to normal positioning. The measured change in pressure is called corneal hysteresis. The cornea has a natural viscoelasticity that dissipates some of the energy from the pressure changes, which factors into the corneal hysteresis reading. Stiffer eyes are less able to dissipate this energy, which results in lower corneal hysteresis readings. This may be seen in patients with certain corneal diagnoses as well as in patients with high IOPs. Low corneal hysteresis is therefore associated with a diagnosis of glaucoma and faster disease progression. It is important to note that with the introduction of any new diagnostic modality, there is some skepticism about the use of corneal hysteresis. Some studies suggest that corneal hysteresis may only be a weak surrogate marker for other biomechanical properties farther back in the eye that have yet to be clarified. Others maintain that corneal hysteresis may be associated with abnormal optic nerve head anatomy and that because central corneal thickness may have a more direct association with glaucoma development, central corneal thickness should take priority. Numerous studies have shown that corneal hysteresis is a useful and statistically relevant biomechanical risk factor for the progression of glaucoma. In a prospective study by Aoki et al., corneal hysteresis was found to be the most sensitive biomechanical factor in glaucomatous progression in patients with primary open-angle glaucoma. This finding has been repeated in various studies, further supporting the use of corneal hysteresis in risk stratification of patients with glaucoma. In addition, one study estimated that for every one millimeter of mercury reduction in corneal hysteresis, the risk of developing glaucoma increased by 21%. Based on these findings, corneal hysteresis should be a factor considered in glaucoma risk stratification and should be considered equally as important to risk stratification as central corneal thickness. Two large studies found the average corneal hysteresis of normal eyes to be between 10.24 and 10.70 millimeters of mercury. Although there is no consensus on what qualifies as low corneal hysteresis value, several studies suggest that a value less than 10 millimeters of mercury should raise concern regarding the development and progression of glaucoma.
A corneal hysteresis measurement may also help guide glaucoma treatment because patients with low corneal hysteresis tend to respond better to prostaglandin analogs and selective laser trabeculoplasty because corneal hysteresis typically rises with effective treatment. Additionally, corneal hysteresis readings may function as a tiebreaker when deciding whether to initiate therapy or continue to observe a patient who is suspected to have primary open angle glaucoma. The aura ranges in price from $8,500 to $15,000, where a pachymeter costs only about $2,500. Many institutions have not decided whether adding corneal hysteresis to their existing risk stratification algorithm is worth the expense. However, knowledge of a patient's corneal hysteresis value may directly affect the treatment of their glaucoma, especially if the appropriate management strategy is unclear. Providers with access to the aura may find its incorporation into primary open angle glaucoma workups worthwhile. Thank you for tuning into this episode of GT the Podcast. If you have any feedback or topic suggestions, find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. And stay tuned for more hot topics in glaucoma care on GT the Podcast. Mm-hmm.